So, there are a few things I wanted to talk about today, and, and I just thought I'd start off with just a general introduction to cancer. Uh, as many of you might have seen on the flyers, I think for this event there's the mention that one in three dogs at some point in their lifetime will develop cancer. Uh, and as high as that number is, it's basically about the same for people. So cancer is not a rare disease. You don't have to do anything wrong to get it. It just happens. We do see it more commonly in middle-aged dogs, but that's not to say you can't see it in puppies. I've had dogs before their first birthday come down with cancer. We see it in dogs that are 15 and 16 years old and anywhere in the middle. So don't assume that because you've got a young dog or a very old dog that they're somehow not going to be at risk of this. Breeds are certainly an issue that is a difference between my side of oncology and the human side um, in that because of the breeding programs we've got, we have inadvertently, accidentally, selected for characteristics that can encourage cancer. Now, an example of that, probably the best example, if uh, many of you are familiar with the Bernese Mountain Dog, which is not a terribly common breed here, but a beautiful dog. Um, and uh, they have a very big problem with a condition called histiocytic sarcoma, to the point where in some lines the majority of them will actually die of that disease more so than any other condition, any other non-cancerous disease. Um, it's a horrible condition, but the, the, the bright note is, and this is going back two weeks as far as, as cutting edge uh, information, um, there's now going to be a genetic test that will allow breeders to select dogs so that you, the public, can take on a dog with less risk of something like that developing. So, it's not just them, there's lots of other breeds that are a problem. Um, and I don't want to say this in the sense of putting you off pure breed dogs, because I think they're beautiful. Uh, I think cross breeds are beautiful. I don't particularly have a personal preference for any type of dog, whether it's a Kelpie cross or a, or a pedigree golden retriever. And personally, I actually don't care for pedigree in the, in the sense of having a show champion or whatever. That doesn't mean that. That doesn't mean anything to me, and I'm sure for many of you, it's more about the dog's personality and their behaviour and how they get on and the friendship that you develop more than the pedigree. But just So why does, this, why does this happen? Everybody, almost everybody that I see in my consult room when they get a diagnosis of cancer quite understandably wants a cause. They want to be able to pinpoint something that happened to say, this is why my dog got cancer. And the reality is for the vast majority that cause is not, certainly not known and probably not there. The starting point for me is that the vast majority of the of dogs that get cancer get so just because of nothing more than bad luck. What you need to understand about cancer, I think, to get a better feel for what's actually going on, is it's not a single switch. It's not that there was no cancer one day and then there was a cancer the next. It's a gradual progress. You start off with a normal healthy body. One cell will just become a little bit abnormal. It's not a cancer, but it's not quite what it used to be. And that'll happen again and again and again. The average cancer, by the time it forms, has around 100 errors that have all stacked up one after the other. So it's not that when your dog gets a cancer that it's something that happened yesterday or something that happened even last month. It's probably the first change for an eight-year-old dog getting cancer. It may well have been when they were six months old. They might have even been born with that first change. Something could have happened before they were even out of the, out of the womb. So, cancer is a gradual progress. It's basically starting off with normal and then over the years, usually, eventually leading to something that actually is able to take uh, or to lose control and then take over the, the body. One of the things that, that 
I think people overemphasise is the immune system. Um, cancer is not a failure of the immune system. Most dogs with cancer, most people with cancer have a perfectly good immune system. Um, and those that don't, don't really get a higher risk of cancer. So the immune system, if anything, is, is a side player and not an important part. But certainly good health is your best starting point to limit the risks. A small number of cancers are due to things that we can prevent. There's been a number of studies looking at lymphoma in dogs. Um, and lymphoma is a white blood cell cancer. It's, it's terrible in the sense that it doesn't start off as a lump. You don't get any warning that you can act on, essentially. They just suddenly appear with the disease through their entire body. So it's a horrible condition to have. Thankfully, it's very, very responsive to treatment. But there's been a number of studies done, and, and uh, we know that dogs that are heavily exposed to paints and solvents are more likely to get cancer. Dogs that live under high voltage power lines are more likely to get cancer. Dogs that are exposed to 2,4-D, which is a herbicide that uh, you'll be thankful is not used in Perth, um, or hasn't been for many decades. Um, so on the one hand, there is no question that how we live and things we're exposed to can influence the risk of cancer. But before that gets you too scared, what you want to put it into, into perspective with is the fact that if we look at any dog getting lymphoma, it's something that happens once every, roughly, every few thousand years of dog life. So in other words, if you've got 300 dogs all living 10 years, one of them is going to get lymphoma. Okay? If you lock them in the basement and have them breathing in paints and solvents, that risk triples. And that's a pretty scary statistic to think you're exposed to, it, to that um, to, to solvents that then increase that cancer risk threefold, but it still means you've got a hundred dogs of which one will get it. Okay? The point I'm trying to make is that most dogs, even knowing all those factors that, that we do, most dogs that get lymphoma get it just because of bad luck and not something that you as a dog owner could have prevented. So I guess the first thing I'm trying to get rid of is the guilt that a lot of people feel that they've missed something, that they should have done something, that they fed their dog the wrong food, that they didn't do something to prevent cancer. Okay? The vast majority of cases are not under your control, they're not your failure, they're not something you did wrong. One of the most interesting things that I've learned about cancer just in the last few years if we go back to when I um, graduated from university, which was uh, quite a long time ago, um, we were told that cancer was one cell that turned nasty, it split into two, and then those two into four, and it was like this mathematical cascade of equally nasty cells all trying to do things in your body. The reality is, if we look at cancer as a villain, as an evil doer in your body, the first thing is, it doesn't work that way. It's not all these cells turning nasty. It's actually a small number of nasty cells that are creating little kids, and those little kids are largely not part of the problem. So we now know that the, in every lump, literally, if, if I was holding a, a tennis ball-sized lump of cancer in my hand, only about 1% of it is actually nasty. Okay? And so the, the, the challenge for oncologists now is how do we get to that 1%? Because that's really all that matters as far as what actually progresses and makes you sick. Second thing we've learned in the last few years is that if the cancer is, is an evil doer inside your body, it's actually not working alone. Cancer does not take over your body without the specific help and assistance and support of the rest of your body. I was coming back, uh, coming back to what I was saying about the immune system. If you took out all the elements of your immune system and then put in a cancer, that cancer will not spread. It cannot spread elsewhere in the body without your immune system actually aiding and abetting and spreading. And the reason it does that is that cancer corrupts the tissues. So as far as, as the, the, the evil of cancer inside your body, it's actually working with the full support of the tissue it's embedded in. And again, while that can, can make it sound even scarier than just one thing trying to overpower you, the importance of this is 
now that it's directing research heavily into how do we interfere with that corruption. And there are now treatments that we've got available that are very simple, very well tolerated, um, unfortunately have to be given forever. But what those treatments now do that we didn't, couldn't do uh, you know, as little as 10 to 20 years ago, they're now interrupting that corruption process. And so we can now stop cancer, not allowing it to talk to the tissues around. So things are starting to change and we're getting much better at keeping our dogs with cancer happy. One of the problems that, that I find people have to face when they get a diagnosis of cancer in one of their pets is it's despair sets in very, very quickly. And there's almost this instance of uh, this feeling of we can't do anything or we shouldn't do anything, that somehow cancer is is separate. Before I became a, a, an oncologist, um, I was working in the broader field of internal medicine, which is basically just dogs that are very sick, uh, with all sorts of complex diseases. And in that field, I would see a lot of dogs with, with severe heart failure, with severe kidney failure. And I really never found people resisted the idea of helping their dog with heart failure. They bring in their dog who had terrible quality of life, and we would do what we could to lift their quality of life and make them happy. We'd never make them normal. With congestive heart failure, you're never feeling 100%, but you'd feel good and you'd feel okay. I then have patients come in with cancer and suddenly people are going, well, it's cancer. We, shouldn't, we shouldn't do the same thing. What I do want to start thinking about is when you're faced with cancer, don't treat it as like it's some special, separate, sacred condition. It's not. It's just a problem in the body. And if we can manage that and improve quality of life exactly the same as we do with congestive heart failure, exactly the same as we do with kidney disease, countless other conditions that, that dogs and people all get, if we just back off and treat it as something that we can look at trying to improve quality of life and make those dogs happy, then all that pressure fades away and it's actually a much uh, straightforward situation to deal with what people imagine. So the bottom line is One is, I guess, to, to summarise that is what I what I'd like everyone here to at least think about when they leave today is that when a diagnosis of cancer is made, it's one thing to fight the cancer, but it's far more important when it's your dog. Just help the patient, okay? And there's lots of ways of doing that. That can mean reducing the cancer. It can mean covering up the effects of the cancer. It doesn't matter. We just focus on helping the patient as the number one goal, and everything else flows from that.